you. Thank you. Good evening, my friends. My name is Ming, and I have the coolest job title in corporate America. <laughs> you may wonder, how did I get this cool job title? So, I'm sorry, let me organize this a little bit. When I joined Google, it was uh, a long time ago. In fact, I'm so old, I joined Google in the last millennium. <laughs> so during the last millennium, when I joined Google, uh, it was a startup, small and profitable startup. And in a startup, nobody has job titles. So I had a generic job title, which was software engineer. And so after a while, as the company grew bigger, we started having a career ladder, ladder, ladder. <laughs> and of course, like engineers make fun of HR all the time, right? So the highest ranking engineer in Google is called a Google Fellow. And I made a joke, I said, hey, why be a Google Fellow when it can be, I don't know, a jolly good fellow? <laughs> People laugh, and my philosophy is if everybody laughs, that's the right thing to do. So I sent this card for printing. Oh, I sent this for printing without telling HR. <laughs> you see, that's why I put, which nobody can deny, right? because I was expecting, I mean, I knew that HR would eventually have to approve this. So, and I expected them to deny this. And if and when they did, I have a joke to tell. So either way, I win, right? <laughs> Turns out, HR also had a sense of humor. So they approved this, to my surprise. <laughs> and then I got, a front, I got on the front page of the New York Times, and I was stuck with this ever since. <laughs> Speaking on the front page of the New York Times. So this was me, on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, this is a, a story about a, a very strange Google tradition, where anybody who's famous who comes to Google have a picture with me, and they go on the wall, the wall of Ming. <laughs> By the way, oops, uh, battery. Somebody needs to power the battery. <laughs> I, t I tell my friends, I'm the only person who has been on the front page of the New York Times four times in one day. <laughs> oh, uh, this sex scandal thing? Yeah, that's not me. <laughs> Sorry, sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> so how, how did this come about? It came about innocently enough. Right? Uh, this guy called El Gore visited Google and asked for a picture of him to impress my mom. I mean, if you're Chinese, you need to impress your parents all the time. <laughs> so this impressed mom and dad. And then uh, this uh, president and Mrs. Carter visited. So I asked for this picture to impress mom and dad and then put them outside my office, and if you put two pictures outside your office like this, it snowballs, and it became a tradition. And that's, that's how it began, and I've been doing this ever since. And so here are some pictures with me and the other people. <laughs> here, for example, you see President Clinton and her husband, Bill. <laughs> uh, future President Clinton. The other naughty thing I did most recently was as an engineer, I created... So engineers have 20% uh, time where one day a week we are allowed to do whatever we want. And I decided to spend this time creating a curriculum for emotional intelligence called Search Inside Yourself. And it became a topic of a best-selling book. You know what's the best thing about this book, in my opinion? It's the back cover. <laughs> because you see endorsements by the Dalai Lama and Jimmy Carter. You see, my friends, this is how you know it's a good book. <laughs> because what are the chances that the Dalai Lama and Jimmy Carter are both wrong at the same time? <laughs> so, Search Inside Yourself is a curriculum on emotional intelligence. And you might ask, what is emotional intelligence? Let me answer that with a parable. So a parable of a man on the horse, and the guy on the horse is just going slowly along the street, and there's a guy standing on the street, and the guy standing on the street asking the guy on the horse, hey, rider, where are you going? And the rider says, I don't know, why are you asking me? You should be asking the horse, duh. 
which sounds silly, right? However, this is something that we engage in every day because the horse represents our emotional mind and the rider represents our thinking mind. And we live this illusion that our emotional mind dominates our thinking mind, that it takes us wherever it wants to go and the thinking mind has no control. And sometimes it gets worse, sometimes it feels like this. <laughs> right? When you have strong emotions, hatred, anger, jealousy, and so on. <laughs> so my friends, there's good news. The good news is that you can go from this to this. <laughs> You can go from skilllessness with emotions to skillfulness with training. That's the good news. What's the bad news? There is no bad news. <laughs> with me, there's only good news and better news, right? which is why people love me, not just because I'm so good looking. <laughs> oh, by the way, I keep repeating I'm so good looking because if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes true. <laughs> The better news is that you can go from this, oh, in humor timings, everything, <laughs> to this. <laughs> you can go from skilllessness to skillfulness to mastery over emotions with training. So, how do you do that? How do you train? Uh, the first thing is to, is to recognize that emotional intelligence cannot be. Did I lose some slides? Oh, okay, sorry. What is emotional intelligence? The standard definition is this. This is the scientific definition. The ability to monitor one's own and others' feelings and emotions, to discriminate among them, and most importantly, to use this information to guide one's thinking and actions. This is emotional intelligence. There is another definition of EI, which I think is shorter and more useful, which is that EI is a collection of emotional skills. And that's important, why? Because all skills are trainable. Therefore, if emotional intelligence is just a collection of skills, then EI is trainable. Again, that's the good news. The good news is that in our work, we discover this to be true. The better news is that we discover that we can train EI to a degree, to a meaningful degree, to a degree that changes people's lives in as little as seven weeks. 20 hours of class time, 50 hours of training. That's all it took. So the thing to learn, to know about, about EI, the first thing is that it cannot be learned. It can only be trained. Trained, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Humor, timing, everything. <laughs> it is like physical fitness. You cannot learn to become physically fit. You have to train. And then the question is why? Why can you do this? The reason is a feature of the brain called neuroplasticity, which is what you do, what you think, and most importantly, what you pay attention to changes the structure and function of the brain, even for adults, even for engineers. And because you can do this, because you can deliberately change your, the structure and function of the brain with what you think, do, and pay attention to, that is how we can train emotional intelligence or any other skill that we deliberately train. In fact, this uh, quality of, of the brain, neuroplasticity, uh, the, it was one of the places where it was first discovered was right here in London. So a couple of years ago, a bunch of scientists had this hypothesis that the brain is, is malleable, it's plastic. And so they're looking for a population of people, very specific population. Let's find a group of people who does a specific job uh, in, in a way that we understand that they use, a, they use a certain skill that the general population doesn't use so much, and the skill uses a certain part of the brain that we understand. Which could this population be, right? So the, the story I heard was that the two scientists were talking about this loudly on a plane. And the guy sitting next to them, a total stranger, says, London cabbies. Right? Because to be a London cabbie, you have to pass a test which requires you to uh, know how to navigate any to, any, from any point to any other point in London, in the head. Right? And it's, it, it's very hard to pass a test. 
And so by the time they pass it, and we know, we know the part of the brain that is responsible for directions, the hippocampus. So the theory is that for London cabbies, their hippocampi must be bigger and more active. And it turns out to be true. And the longer you've been driving a cab, the bigger and more active the hippocampi is. So now we know that what you think and do and, and attend to changes the brain. So given that, how do you train emotional intelligence? You can do it in three easy steps. And step one is attention, training of attention, which sounds counterintuitive, right? You say, wait, 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 what does attention have to do with emotional intelligence? Doesn't make a lot of sense, right? When I say attention here, I mean something very specific. I mean the quality of attention that allows you to bring your mind to a state that is calm and clear, and to do this on demand. Calm and clear state on demand. Or in other words, to calm the mind on demand. What does this do for you? The first thing it does for you is, is something that is uh, talked about by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl says, uh, between stimulus and response, there is a space, right? And in this space lies your freedom and power to choose your response. Now, if you, if you develop this ability to calm the mind on demand, even in times of stress and difficulty, what you're doing is you, you're creating the ability to access that space between stimulus and response reliably. And once you can do that, what do you gain? You gain choice, power, freedom. Freedom, my friends, based on this one simple skill. But wait, there's more. It gets better. There's also implications for leadership, this skill. Uh, what, I, what do I mean? Supposing you're in a meeting room where everything's going wrong, right? So everybody's panicking, you know? And you alone can calm the mind and think clearly. What happens? Everybody in the room will look at you and they feel that you are the leader. This is leadership. Right? So if you have this ability, you start appearing as, as a leader. So for those of you who are working, next promotion cycle, guess who gets considered? Right? <laughs> and this skill is also the foundation of all higher cognitive and emotional skills. It builds the foundation. Sounds good, right? So how? How do you train this? Turns out it's very easy, like so easy that even I could get it. The way to train this is with a technique called mindfulness. Oh, <laughs> Gets me every time. Oh. <laughs> and mindfulness is defined as paying attention, but not just paying attention. Paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and most importantly, non-judgmentally. So this is how we train mindfulness. And in mindfulness, we train mastery over attention. Shall we do a simple exercise? 10 seconds, very quick. Okay. So for 10 seconds, I want you to do this. I want you to bring attention to the process of breathing, whatever that means to you. And if you need something more specific, pay attention to the sensation at the nose. And every time your attention wanders away, Bring it back. Sounds easy? Shall we try that? Okay, 10 seconds beginning now. <coughs> Thank you. That was 10 seconds. How was it? It's not bad, right? It's very calming. Well, unfortunately, this is, this is the part of my talk where Mark is asking me for his money back. <laughs> because uh, if I were to do this to an audience of engineers, they'll be asking me what we call the WTF question. <laughs> and for those of you who don't, don't, know, don't know what it stands for, WTF stands for what is happening. <laughs> and the WTF question is, how can this possibly do me any good? Right? You say, wait, wait, I bring attention to my breath, you want this to bring it back. 
What can this do for me? I couldn't figure it out. To answer this question, I'm going to use an analogy. The analogy is that pretend nobody in this room knows anything about physical fitness. Nobody knows anything about exercise. And pretend that we all just did one bicep curl. Right? And if we do that, it should be the, the engineers will be asking the same question. Right? The WTF question. Okay? How can this possibly do me any good? I take a heavy object, I move it up, I move it down. Makes no sense. Right? However, if you know about physical fitness, you know the answer. Which is that every time you do one of this, what happens? You strengthen the muscles a little bit more, right? And if you do a lot of this, and maybe other exercises too, what happens? The first thing that happens is that you acquire a quality called strength. And when you acquire the quality of strength, you start to have capabilities that you can never imagine before, and you can start doing things imagine, you never imagined doing before. For example, you can now carry heavy objects. Right? You can throw out the boyfriend. <laughs> Boyfriend says, take out the trash. Sure. <laughs> Besides throwing out the boyfriend, what else happens? Something happened, which is that if you do this exercise, you also develop something called health and fitness. And when that happens, you discover that you have more energy. You have fewer sick days. And because of that, you become more successful at work just because you have more energy and fewer sickness, right? And you feel confident when you're physically fit. And you, look, you like the way you look in the mirror, right? You're happy. You, you feel like you're well, you're well-being. You feel great all the time. So this simple act, up, down, up, down, has implications that leads all the way to success wellness, happiness, feeling great, looking good. All good things. And if you never heard of the concept of exercise, the claim I just made should be mind-blowing. Like, this is a huge claim. Like This leads to success, happiness, and so on. And I'm going to make the same claim about the exercise we just did for 10 seconds, which is that every time you bring a wandering attention back, it is like doing one bicep curl for the mind or for the brain. You're strengthening the muscles of attention, specifically the prefrontal cortex. You strengthen the muscles a little bit more every time you bring it back. And if you do this a lot, you strengthen the muscles of attention enough to gain mastery over attention. And once you do that, the, one of the first abilities you develop is the ability to calm the mind on demand and to bring it to a, to a state as calm and clear. So that's how you do it. Pretty cool, right? I mean, it's a life-changing skill once, once you pick it up. But there's only step one. There are two more steps to go. So, okay. Step two is building the kind of self-knowledge that leads to self-mastery. So remember I talked about calm and clear mind. We, we basically talk about calmness, but there's this other aspect, which is clarity, clarity of mind. Specifically, there's, there's something very specific about this, which is you gain the ability to perceive the process of emotion at high resolution. High resolution perception of the process of emotion. So first, what does it mean? What does it mean to have high resolution? So this is a picture of low resolution. And you don't really know what, what, is, what it means, right? So if we increase the resolution, we find that it is a picture of some old guy trying to hide the recipe of chicken. <laughs> See, now we have useful information. So what resolution does for you is it gives you useful information. And when we talk about the process of emotion, we're talking about two specific dimensions. The first dimension is spatial, which is the ability to perceive small changes in the process of emotion. The second dimension is uh, temporal which means the ability to do that in thin slices of time. In other words, in real time. So what does that do for you? Combine. The first thing it does for you is that you, you develop the ability to see an emotion the moment it's arising, the moment it's passing, and all the subtle changes in between. Right? And one thing that does for you is you develop self-awareness skills. 
So for example, the first thing you develop is precise emotional awareness. That you begin to be able to precisely see emotions as they happen and see the effect, tiny changes. That leads to accurate self-assessment, right? Because of the, the data that you have now, you now are able to see what are my weaknesses, what are my strengths, what makes me happy, what makes me unhappy, what are my resources, what are my limitations, and most importantly, <coughs> who am I? Right? You get all that information. And that leads to something, something important. It leads to self-confidence. Because if you understand yourself to a certain level, then you reach a state where there is no skeleton in your closet that you don't already know about, that you're not already comfortable with. So you become comfortable in your own skin. Right? And because of that, you have the type of confidence that doesn't rely on puffing yourself up. It's a confidence that is, has, a, has a trace of humility in it. And it gets better. Sometimes having insights Sometimes having one insight can profoundly change your life. So let me give you one example that relates to this emotional precision. When we experience emotion, we experience it existentially. For example, I say, I am happy. I am sad. I am angry. Right? I am the emotion. The emotion is me. There is no difference. And because there's no difference, there's nothing I can do. I, I am angry, what can I do? As your mind sharpens enough where you can see the resolution, uh, see emotion in high resolution, you might experience a subtle shift. Very small, but very meaningful. And the subtle shift is going from ex existential to experiential, which is going from I am angry to I am experiencing anger. And what difference does that make? The difference it makes is that creates uh, the opportunity for something called the big sky mind, which is the idea that the, sky, the mind is on the sky and emotions are like clouds in the sky and fundamentally the clouds are not the sky. Therefore, in the same way, my feelings are not me, I am not my feelings. My thoughts are not me, I am not my thoughts. And if you are, for example, somebody stuck in a cycle of depression, that insight is the first break out of the cycle of depression. I am not my thoughts, I am not my feelings, I am not my emotions. Very powerful insight, right? But wait, it gets better. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> Which is, as your perception sharpens, sometimes there is a, there's another, another shift which is going from existential to physiological. So what does that mean? Uh, it means the ability to see, to perceive the, the experience of emotion simply as an experience in the body. So again, what does that mean? So I'm an animated Chinese guy. Right? You don't see a lot of us, lot of us around, right? But you must, because I'm so animated, sometimes I might like hit something and hurt my hand. Right? And if I do that, I'll be in pain, right? And I'll go like, ah! But I also know that this experience of pain is simply an experience in my body. And because it's just that, I have options. I can ice my hand, I can massage my hand, I can ignore the pain, I can distract myself by eating ice cream, I can experience it uh, mindfully because I came to a talk by some very good looking guy about mindfulness. <laughs> I have options because it's simply an experience in my body. Imagine when you're able to perceive the experience of emotion as just that. This sadness, this profound sadness I'm, I'm feeling is the same level as this pain in my hand. If those two things are the same level of experience, that, my friend, is the beginning of mastery over the emotion process. So the insight is very powerful. And there's a little bit of cartoon here to illustrate that. So, and again, but wait, there's more. <laughs> that, those are step two. 
Step three, in addition to all those two things, is to create useful mental habits. When I say useful mental habits here, I specifically refer to uh, pro-social mental habits. So what does that mean? Let me give you an example of a pro-social mental habit, which is kindness. The mental habit of kindness is to look at, randomly look at a human being. And the first thought is, I wish for this guy to be happy. I wish for this lady to be happy. That's the first thought when you see a human being. Why? Because it is a habit. For no other reason than because it is a habit. Imagine having that habit. What happens? Everything changes, right? Because you, look, you walk into a room, you look at a room full of people and have the habit, wishing for people to be happy. They all look at you and they like you. Right? Because it's, it's picked up unconsciously by the, by the brain, uh, through your, your uh, posture, your, your facial expression, tone of voice, and so on and so forth. And so unconsciously they like you and they don't really know why. They think it's because you're very good looking in your Chinese suit. <laughs> or something like that. And it helps you to be successful. And it's good, it's good for you, it's good for them. It's good for the whole, and it's good for success. So, how do you, and, and what happens if you have a habit? Habit eventually becomes character. Character eventually becomes you. So by training the habit of kindness, eventually you become a kind person. It changes you into a kind person. And all it takes is to develop a habit. That's powerful stuff, right? Shall we do an experiment? Oh, by the way, before that, so how do you develop a habit? Easy. If you do something often enough, it becomes a habit, right? So the way to develop a habit of kindness is just randomly look at people and just think, I wish for this person to be happy. Just do that often enough, 30, 60 times, it, it becomes a habit. Shall we do an experiment for 10 seconds? For 10 seconds, randomly identify two human beings in this room and then wish for them to be happy. Ah, don't say anything. Don't do anything. Just think. Just think. I wish for that guy to be happy and I wish for that lady to be happy. I don't point also. I'm just frustrated. <laughs> so, so that's it. This is an entirely thinking experiment. Shall we try that? Okay, 10 seconds begins now. Okay, time's up. How was this? Did you notice you're smiling when you did that? <laughs> right? Did you notice that when you wish to be on the giving end of a thought of kindness, it's an intrinsically rewarding experience. Right? Just thinking, I wish for a random person to be happy. That alone creates happiness for a moment, right? <laughs> And my friends, if that is true, if what I just said is true, then you may have just discovered a secret to happiness. All other things equal. Nothing changes. All you do is randomly wish for people to be happy, and you will increase your happiness. Doesn't cost a single thing. Right? Fascinating, right? So you might ask, what, what's the limit of this? How far can you push this? <clears throat> Couple of uh, months ago, I gave a talk on the Monday evening. And then uh, we did this exercise, and I, I made a suggestion. I said, okay, tomorrow, Tuesday, is a working day. Go back to the office. Here's what you do. Every hour, spend 10 seconds randomly wishing for two people to be happy. I mean, two people who walk past your office, right? Wish for this guy to be happy, that guy to be happy. Go back to work. Don't say anything, don't do anything. Just think. So it's not embarrassing at all. <laughs> so I said, try this, see what happens. And I wasn't actually expecting anything. On Wednesday morning, I received an email from a total stranger. And this person says, I hate my job. I hate coming to work every single day. But I went to your talk on Monday, and on Tuesday, I tried out your suggestion, and Tuesday was my happiest day in seven years. <laughs> and all it took was 10 seconds, an hour, of wishing somebody to be happy. That was all. It's a powerful stuff. Oh, wait, it gets, it gets better. <laughs> which is, 
Remember earlier I talked about this, that, that if, you, if you are in a meeting room, I mean, if you meet people and wish for them to be happy all the time, you become more successful over time because people like you and want to help you succeed. It turns out that this effect is even more pronounced for leaders. And there was a study done a couple of years ago. And this study showed that, at least according to this population sample, that the difference between the best performing managers and the worst performing managers. There's only one difference, which is the best performing managers, they love people and they want to be loved. Which is surprising, at least to me. Right? I mean, I grew up thinking that you have to, as a boss, you have to choose between getting things done or being loved. Right? Choose one or other. And it turns out that you choose both at once. Being loved is good for your career as a manager. Why? Turns out there's a very simple explanation, which is that all other things equal, the more your people love you, the harder they work. The harder they work, the more successful you are. It's as simple as that. Right? So it turns out that to be kind and loving to your people is good for your soul. You go to heaven after this. It's good for, your, it's good for productivity. It's good for success and it's good for employees. There is no downside. Everybody wins. Right? Kindness is it's a fascinatingly wonderful thing. And then you might ask, yeah, 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 there must be exceptions. There must be situations where this doesn't work. So, okay, what's the most extreme situation? How about the Navy? Right? You send people to the death. Turns out it has been studied. So in 1988, there was a study published about what makes them the most effective naval commanders in the US Navy. And they were described in these words. Outgoing, positive, expressive, dramatic, warm, sociable, appreciative, trustful, gentle. And the title of this study was Nice Guys Finish First. <laughs> By the way, back then they were all guys. I gave this talk to a bunch of, a group of naval commanders who came to visit Google. And these are the commanders who like, I mean, they're chosen to like visit companies, so they're like outstanding performers, even among the top naval officers. And some of them are, are Navy SEALs, and some of them are top guns. So they're the, the best of the best of the best. And I asked them, is this true for you? And they all said yes. So even for Navy SEALs, even for top gun pilots. So nobody else has an excuse to not be nice to employees. <laughs> Speaking about nice guys in the military. <laughs> so my friends, this is it. Easy. Three easy steps to training emotional intelligence. I've been running this class. Uh, so in 2007, I started a pilot. So I've been running a, this class since then. And the feedback I keep getting from, from Google employees is this. It's, so for some people, they say they got a, a promotions because of this class. Some people say their marriage improved. Some people's health improved. You know, I mean, the physical health improved, and so on. Uh, the one thing I keep hearing consistently is this. Is your class changed my life. Imagine coming to work on a Monday or a Tuesday, you take a class and it changes your life. Then imagine being on the giving end of that curriculum. And that's my life. I'm very lucky. So, oh, by the way, uh, and uh, with Google's permission, I've, I've been permitted to bring this outside of Google to, to serve the world. And so I, I set up a, a an institute called the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. And you know that I named this institute because I named it Silly. <laughs> so for anybody interested in emotional intelligence, get serious about Silly. <laughs> okay, the last story I want to tell. Uh, why did I do this? The reason I did this, I had one simple dream. All I wanted to do was to create the condition for world peace in my lifetime. <laughs> that was all. <laughs> in 2003, I was taking a walk outside the Google campus back then, which back then was a, a small cluster of, of tiny buildings. So I was taking a walk. 
And I had this moment where I think some of you will have, the moment where you, you know what you want to do for the rest of your life. I had that moment. And I know for the rest of my life, I want to create the conditions for world peace in my lifetime. World peace in my lifetime. That was what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I figured out how to do that. I figured out the way to do that is to scale inner peace, inner joy, and compassion worldwide. Because if these three qualities are scaled worldwide, then we have the conditions for world peace in my lifetime. And then I figured out how to do that. I figured the way to do that is to align peace, joy, and compassion with success and profits. <laughs> because if I were to go around talking about goodness, what happens? Yeah, yeah, and they go home and nothing changes, right? <laughs> However, if I were to teach people the formula for success and profits, making more money, getting promotion, and in a way where peace, joy, and compassion are the necessary and unavoidable side effects of the training, then it will spread. Then we have the conditions for world peace in my lifetime. How to do that? I figured it out. The answer, the, or the vehicle, was emotional intelligence, EI. Because everybody knows that EI thing is good for my career. Right? Every boss knows if my team has EI, we're going to make a lot of money. But nobody really knows how to train it in adults. So, and when we try to figure it out, in a way where goodness is the unavoidable side effect. And out of that came Search Inside Yourself. So that has been my work for the past couple of years. And I hope you find this talk useful. And I hope that together, we will create the conditions for world peace in our lifetimes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I know you've left time specifically to be able to interact with the audience, so I'm sure people have got lots of questions. I, I guess I was struck, first of all, myself with, you've obviously started this inside Google, a, a company that many of us would look to as a kind of example of, in some ways, a leader in well-being and, and a, a, having a good culture. To what extent, as well as seeing those individual stories of change, for, for people saying it's changed my life, have you seen that this has an impact on a culture inside an organisation? Uh, not yet. And the reason not yet is because uh, Google is growing so quickly. Right. right. And so, yeah, it's, we haven't seen it. I have seen it at the individual level and to some degree at, at the team level. So, for example, there is a, uh, there's a person, uh, a manager actually. She manages about 10 people. And after she, after she completed my class, she told me something. She told me that she realized that she has been repressing her emotions. And she stopped doing that, right? in, in a healthy way, of course. And when she stopped doing that, her physical health improved. And because of that, the number of her sick days drastically reduced. So that alone, I think, benefited has, has her a team. Big impact. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So let's turn to the audience. I'm sure lots of you have got questions. So we'll start with the lady here who had her hand up first. There were microphones, actually. Could you just wait for one second so we can all hear your question? Thank you. Thank you for the thoughtful and Can I ask very... your name? Yeah, my name is Dania. Dania. Hi, Dania. Hi. Um, it's very inspirational and very provocative. Um, my question, which is, there is a cycle I get into in my life because I'm growing in my career. Mm -hmm. I'm a researcher, so it's really depends on you and your own motivation. Mm -hmm. How come, in, sir, how applicable what you said about how you can separate yourself and your feeling from some time when you're having down times in your career. Mm. Because, of course, my productivity related with my publication, related with my repetition as a researcher at the end. Mm. So how can I get a little bit deattached or how applicable this can be done using the concept? When you say downtime, do you mean uh, times when nothing is happening? or time where, where times are tough? You feel it's tough, and at the same time you feel you're tired, you can't continue, ah. but at the same time you can't stop because you right. just need to catch up. Right, right, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
I think what we're talking about here is resilience, right? When times are tough, what can you do? Like, what are the practices that allow you to move forward? Uh, there are three, three practices, or three, three uh, groups of practices. The first are uh, attention, <coughs> attention, which is the ability to calm the mind on demand, right? That skill alone, right? When things are tough, when you're feeling that you're failure, which happens to me all the time, you know, everything's falling apart, I'm failing, I'm, 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 I'm lousy at my job, I'm gonna get fired. If you can calm the mind, that alone, half the problem goes away, right? You feel better already. So that's the first step. First step, calm the mind. But obviously not enough, right? Because when it stops calming the mind, it comes back, right? What to do? Then you introduce the second step. The second step is effective, is to deal with the emotions specifically in the body. So in this specific case, uh, to, to be able to see the emotionality involved with success and failure simply as experience in the body. So I'm successful, people love me, I'm getting promotion. This is how it feels like, it's just experience in the body, that's all. And the reverse, right? I just feel my project, my boss, my boss might fire me, blah, blah, blah. It feels horrible. Again, just experience in the body. So seeing it at that level reduces suffering even more. But still there's some left. So it introduce the third step. The third step is, is cognitive. It's how you think about this. And the cognitive step uh, involves something called learned optimism. Learning to be optimistic. For example, one way to, to see that is you, you, may, you may realize that we, we pay more attention to negative experiences than positive experiences. Right? For example, if I see Mark and say, hey Mark, and he was like, hey, slightly positive, no effect. But if I say, hey Mark, and he doesn't see me, just, he doesn't look at me, he just, eh, walk, just walk away. I say, like, dude, what's happening, right? I get, I get a reaction. Same magnitude of positive or negative, I get more reaction from the negative. And according to the research, it's three to one. You get, you get, for the same magnitude, you get three times the power from negative experiences versus the positive experience. Therefore, if that's true, let's pretend your life is a two to one ratio. Like for every one bad thing you experience, you experience two good things. Objectively, you have a good life. Subjectively, you say, my life sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, one important step in learning optimism is to be able to see that to see objectively, my life doesn't actually suck, <coughs> right? And, and then find, find real data, realistic data, to show that my life is actually better than it is. And I think Rumi has a saying, uh, live as if life is in your favor, or something like that, right? So, so that's a cognitive step. And the cognitive step, if you can do that, that's a solution. However, it cannot be done without these two other steps. Because if all you do is think positive, think positive, Nothing happens. You have, to, you have to resolve the emotionality first. And before you can resolve emotionality, you have to calm the mind first. So these three steps. Attention, effect, cognition. Thank, Thank you. There was another question just behind that same question, the lady with the blonde hair. Um, thanks, Meng. I'm Joanna. Nice to meet you. Joanna? Thank you. Joanna. Joanna. Yeah. Hi, Joanna. Thank you. I'm really intrigued by what you said at the end, that because your motivation was world peace, mm -hmm. but you've... you've I'm like Miss America. <laughs> but you've realised that the way to get other people to take up what you thought were the key things mm. that would lead to that yes. was to, to play to other motivations. Yes. And I'm just intrigued because obviously you've drawn a lot on Eastern philosophy and, and within Buddhism, there's a very heavy emphasis on having the right motivation in a way that there's a particular motivation. Mm. Have you seen that the motivation doesn't really matter if people enter into it from a different motivation? Mm -hmm. Or how do you think that might play out? Yes, uh, in my experience, uh, it doesn't really matter. And, and there are reasons behind it. Uh, so, so a few trends of thoughts in that same time, I'm trying to organize it a little bit. Um, so, what you're familiar with Buddhism, right? So, what I'm doing, there's actually a word for it. It's called upaya. Upaya is, means skillful means. And upaya means do not start from where you are, start from where your student is. 
Otherwise, you can never reach a student. And if the student wants to be successful at work, start there, then lead the student up. So that's the first train of thought. Uh, the second thing is, uh, there are things in life where it doesn't matter where you start from. Uh, one is physical exercise. Right? It doesn't matter what your motivation is. As long as you do it, you will have the same benefit, whether you're trying to slim down, or you're trying to run a marathon, or whatever, or you're trying to spite, not to spite the boss, or whatever, right? <laughs> or spite the husband. So the effect is the same as long as the training is there. And what you just asked relates to a very important debate among, actually among the practitioners, which is ethics. Right? I did not mention ethics in my, my talk. In the old days, uh, if you want to learn meditation in the traditional society where I came from, the teacher will make you, uh, what's the word, <coughs> commit, commit to ethics before you teach you meditation, for good reasons. And, and part of the good reasons is that uh, ethics or morality creates a mind that is uh, a clear conscience. And a clear conscience is conducive to uh, concentration and mindfulness and so on. My own experience is that I think there's a cyclical relationship. That if you are ethical, the mind is more workable. So when you're ethical, you, have, you can meditate better. And if you meditate better, you become more ethical. The reason is that as your practice deepens, the mind comes down and in the calmness, something arises, which is inner joy, arises naturally. Free, the independent of sense pleasure or, ple or pleasure of ego. And after that, there's another effect, which is kindness and compassion also arises. So if you have that effect, if you have inner joy and compassion, you start to like, I mean, the, the reason we do bad things is because we want things, or we want to be bad, uh, ego, right? Objects or ego. And when your thirst for ego or objects start to go down, you start doing less and less bad things. So I like to say I'm, I'm less of an asshole than I used to be. <laughs> so therefore, ethics, meditation, meditation, ethics. And because it's cyclical, my theory is you can start from any of the two and you end with the same result. Thank you. So would you find, Ben, that when someone enters um, one of your programs, perhaps with a slightly selfish yes. um, sort of motivation, mm -hmm. um, that often they will become more compassionate because without ever expecting that to have been one of the outcomes. Yes. Is that, is that, is that very much what happens? That's know? what's happened, but we, I don't really have a controlled experiment because I do tell them that that's, that's what they will become. So I, I'm very open. Yeah. So maybe that was a suggestion. I mean, our <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> okay, let's take you all become good side. people. You all become good people. <laughs> let's take one down at the front here. Can we get a microphone down here? Jasmine. Hi. Hi Ming. I'm Jasmine. Um, Hi, Jasmine. Thank you for a very insightful t talk. It made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask you, um, mm -hmm. I pra practice mindfulness. Um, I'm a chronic pain sufferer. Um, my practice is not such that I'm on bad days. I find it very, very difficult. I know it's good for me. It works. Mm -hmm. I have a bad day today. Didn't get angry with anybody on the way here, so that was really good. But can you make any suggestions about how I could ensure that even on really bad days, I actually do mm. my mindfulness. Mm. Jasmine, are you familiar with MBSR, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction? Are you, are you in the program? Uh, I've just completed the program. You just completed yeah. the program. How did, did you find any changes for yourself? Um, yes. Things that I can't explain. More compassion. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kinder to myself. That was a bit, that's the biggest thing for me. Yes. So I'm a lot kinder to myself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and also uh, the pain, I'm able to manage it a whole lot better mm. than I was able to before. That's good, that's good. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think there are a few things here. The first is celebrate. Right? Be joyful that, that it is better. Right? So, and the joy is really important because the joy becomes an engine for for everything else, in, including our practice. So that's one. Uh, part two is kindness, which is when things are not working, it's not your fault. Right? So be kind to self, which includes don't, uh, uh, don't, be, don't feel bad about taking painkillers. Right? Don't feel bad about, about medication. Uh, specifically, don't feel bad about feeling bad. 
because that just doubles the suffering for no reason. Mm -hmm. right? so, so if you are really suffering, just have the kindness to allow yourself to suffer to the degree that, that, it, that you can. So that's the second thing. Uh, there's one more thing. I want to tell you the theory. And for me to not be in pain to tell you, it's, it's a little bit, on my part, a bit rude. But I'll tell you the theory anyway. I hope that's helpful. The theory is that between pain and suffering, what's the relationship? The relationship is uh, it begins with a stimulus. Uh, and then a sensation. Sensation, perception, aversion, suffering. That is the sequence. Therefore, in theory, if you can remove, reduce or remove aversion, then you get a state where there is a sensation, a perception of pain, but no suffering. And the beautiful illustration came from uh, John Kabat-Zinn's book. Uh, he talked about an old man who came to his class on, on a wheelchair. And this old man, he's, he's, he was in so much pain that his feet could not touch the ground. Even, every time his feet touch the ground, the whole body is in pain. And everybody felt bad for him. And he, this guy, he said, he didn't even know why he was in the class. His painkiller is not working, nothing's working, and he's so desperate, he's willing to try any nonsense, including this meditation nonsense. So he came here. And in the progress of eight weeks, he graduated from wheelchair to crutches to cane. And so John asked him, like at the end of the process, what changed? Like, is the pain different? And the old guy says, no, the pain feels exactly the same. What changed was my relationship to the pain. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind while continuing to be kind to yourself. And over time, see if there's any change. And any change, rejoice. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you. Let's take one um, towards the centre over here. Mm -hmm. Lady with this might be. Oh, well, let's take the gentleman here and then the lady behind. Um, hi there. Um, my name's Kai. Um, hi, Kai. Great talk. I, I'm just trying to find my words here to what I'm trying to explain, but um, I've read a lot of books over the years, you know, on this path of mind science, elasticity, and mm -hmm. changing your brain and things. And the reason I was doing that was because I was getting emotions I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get my head around them and get a better understanding and having them stop affecting me because I, you know, I didn't understand why they existed. It's about some depression up and down. Um, and then eventually I worked out that it actually wasn't to do with my mind, it was a physical illness that doctors didn't recognize that it was caused by stress mm -hmm. from trying to achieve things. Um, and it was directly related to adrenal uh, fatigue and adrenal suffering. Right. And particularly in this country, it's not a recognized condition. And you know, I'd been having these symptoms for you know, 15 plus years, driving me mad, you know reading books and books and books and coming to talks and trying to get my head around and putting it into practice and then symptoms reappearing. Um, I don't know how it is in America. I don't know if they, you know, they, you know, recognize these conditions. But um, do you build this into your thinking? Do you build this into your writings? Do you build these kind of unknowns in that it doesn't matter how much you get involved with these subjects, sometimes there's something else at the root cause that's causing problems? Uh, no, I didn't put that in my writing. But uh, the, the answers are basically the same as, as what I told to, to Jasmine. Uh, the reason I didn't do that is because that has already been, there's, there's already been a, a, a curriculum for it. Mindfulness based stress reduction and BSR. So I, I suggest, uh, have you taken MBSR? No, I haven't. No, no. Okay, now take a look at it. It might be helpful. Uh, no, I'm better now. I'm just, I'm, I'm okay. all, all good. It's grand. But, yeah. um, Mm -hmm. I just thought it would be insightful for you because you're going to you're going to environments where people are stressed, basically. People are stressed. Hmm, I never came across that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're all suffering. We're all suffering in different ways. And I think that this, uh, specifically, every afflictive emotion in general, every particular can, can be addressed in three steps, which I talked about earlier, which is first, attention. Like, calm the mind. Second, deal with the effect. The effect deep part of the experience, and the third is cognitive. Think about it in a different way, different perspective. So, yeah, try that out. See yeah, 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 grand. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, and there's a lady in a light blue top just a few rows back there, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, hello, my name is Angeliki. Hmm? Angeliki. Angeliki. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. um, I have been reading about um, this topic and, in general, um, mind thoughtfulness and consciousness, um, and wanting to um, sort of try and bring presence to my mind and sort of control it. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, of course, difficult when we take practice. And what I wanted to ask you is two things. One is you coming to talk to us, for example, is very inspiring. It kind of reaffirms the message, etc. Mm -hmm. And I feel that there's a lot happening on this level of people in society. Yes. I personally find it very um, uh, worrying and I lose hope when I look at what leaders in our society are doing. Mm -hmm whether they're government leaders, military, or if they're leaders of large corporations. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd feel a very a huge disalignment with what we're talking about right. and them and yes. what they're doing to the world, our society, etc. Yes. So with your vision in mind for the future about bringing peace to the world, um, <laughs> with the fact that you've met a lot of leaders yourself, what are what is your view of it? What do you see from your experiences happening in those higher levels? Mm. And is there hope for the future? Mm -hmm. And how do you suggest that people like us, or like me say, deal with it mm. when some days I hear things, read things in the news or some new initiative regulations coming in and I think, what are they thinking of? Mm -hmm. Right. So the first part of the question, uh, how hopeful am I? I'm very optimistic. I'm so optimistic, I'm going to make a statement. I say this problem will be solved in one or at most two generations. So why do I say that? Right? Uh, if you, there's a historical precedence, which is, again, physical fitness. Physical fitness for a long time was a domain of very small groups of people, highly specialized people, people in the, in the military, people who are professional athletes, and so on. Right? Most people don't exercise. The first change occurred, or the first crack occurred in 1927, when a group of people tried to study exercise as a scientific subject, which has never been done before then. It was so, the idea was so new, it was considered crazy. Right? So why would any self-respecting scientist in Harvard, no less, want to study exercise? And it turns out they have a quote-unquote ulterior motive, because they themselves exercise, and they know it's good, and they want to they want to show it with science. They could not find any funding. The only funding they could get was from the military, for obvious reasons, and the, they couldn't do it in medical school. They had to do it in business school. So they, they created the Harvard Fatigue Lab, and their first finding was that the physical, sorry, the, the fit body is physiologically different from the unfit body. Physiologically different. And with training, you can go from unfit to fit. And that changed everything. And eventually, everything changed. Eventually, everybody exercised. And so that's the first part, the science. There's a second thing, part, I think it's even more important, that has never been mentioned, which is there is a, very, there is a point of critical mass. And one or two generations before the critical mass, this is what happens. When exercise was widespread enough that some let's say 10% of people or something exercise, and they become more successful at work. Right? For all the reasons we talked about, they have fewer sick days and more energy, they become more successful, and when they become the CEOs of the world, young people look at them and say, I want to be like, I want to be like that guy when I grew up. And they ask him, what, what's your secret? They say, well, because I go to the gym three times a week. So eventually, everybody wants to go to the gym three times a week. Right? And so that's how, exercise spread, at least within companies. And if you look at Goldman Sachs, everybody in Goldman Sachs I've ever met is physically very, very fit. There's a culture of, of that. In the same way, I think that somewhere around now, or maybe one generation from now, we would have reached critical mass where there will be a large enough population of people who get successful because of their mindfulness practice. And not just successful, they're successful in the good way. Right, in the way that people admire, because they're, they're kind, and, and they are, they're, uh, they're compassionate, and they're giving, and so on. And because of that, the young people will be asking them, what makes you so successful? What can I learn from you? And they will say, mindfulness, read Ming's book, 
Reaming's book again. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, in one or two generations, you will shift. That's my hope. Thank you. Thank Can you. I? Let me, um, let me just add to that from a, a, a British perspective. I'm not sure if any of you in the room know, in fact, we mentioned this briefly when John Kabat-Zinn came here last year to talk, but for about the last year and a bit, there's been some mindfulness courses running inside, uh, inside Westminster for parliamentarians, for MPs and Lords. Initially, a reasonably small group turned up to it, but I think now, getting on for 100 or so, I'm not sure the exact numbers, have now done that uh, kind of training with people like Mark Williams from the Oxford Mindfulness Centre and Chris Cullen and others. So there are starting to be people inside the political establishment that are not only being aware of this, but actually practicing an MBSR type course. So I think that's really powerful. And I mean, that's the beginnings of that, yeah. that shift. Of course, uh, I, I certainly agree with the sentiment behind the question that there's a long way to go. That also combined with um, things like the Wisdom 2.0 conference that's been big in the US and I gather is now potentially coming to Europe as well, where we see business leaders saying mindfulness is a way of you know, really succeeding. And I think um, th those two trends, if they carry on, hopefully give evidence to that, that hope. Can I answer the, the next part of the question that I forgot to talk about? Uh, what can you do? Right? Uh, this is for everybody. I, I, I hope you all do this. Uh, three things. The first is right understanding. Right? So the understanding of how this work can benefit you and benefit the world. Second part is practice. And practice has two components. The first component is micro practices, which means that simple things, right? Uh, when you're starting a computer, take one breath. It doesn't cost you anything, right? Or if you're stressed, take one breath. And if you're walking to the restroom, do mindful walking for at least three steps. It doesn't cost you anything. So these are the micro practices. And they are, they are actually very powerful, by the way. Uh, how powerful are they? The difference between the best tennis players in the world and the very best tennis players in the world, those who win the Wimbledon of the world, the difference is the ability to rest on demand. Right? So the, the very best in the world, between sets, the 10, 15 seconds between sets, they're able to calm their body and mind. And therefore, they, can go, they, can, they are at a more restful state in every game than the opponent. And because of that, they can sustain high performance for the whole game. And that's why they win. So the micro practices are really important and useful. In addition to that, do the macro practices, which is sitting for 20 minutes or whatever. So taking time to do it. So practice, second component. Third component, show example. Right? Be the change you want to see in the world. Be the kind, loving, calm, joyful person that you want the world to be. And if enough people do that, eventually it will happen. Thank you. And we get world peace. We get world peace, that's right. <laughs> Um, can I just see a show of hands for how many people are still hoping to ask a question? Let's get a sense of how much. Okay, so we've got about sort of 10 questions still remaining. Let's come over here. Um, one of the hands, yeah, by the microphone there. Thank you. Yeah, my, hi, I, my name's Mark. Where are you, Mark? I'm just about here. Oh, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I guess we're all here because at some time we've had a, an educable moment where... Sorry, this been, moment? Edu where we have reached a moment in our lives where this kind of material has resonance oh, to I th us. I thought you are here because I'm so good looking. Uh, that as well. <laughs> we, we, we're quite I'm similar so in that respect. <laughs> yeah. um, my, my question is, um, to reach your goal, it seems there's one body of people we haven't talked about, yes. and that's the young people. Yes. And certainly, my view over the years has been, in the UK, we have a very, very narrow definition of educational success. Mm -hmm. what, what thoughts have you around taking the search inside yourself mm -hmm. into mainstream education for youngsters? It'll be a very good thing. Uh, <clears throat> I forgot my train of thought. Let me think. Uh, hmm? Well, while you're gathering your train of thought, in case anyone isn't aware, there's a programme called Mindfulness in Schools Programme, dot B in the UK, which is doing, taking many of Meng's ideas very, very practically into both secondary and primary schools. And so if anyone is here in educational context, definitely worth checking out dot right. B, Mindfulness in Schools. Uh, I just talked to Father Lawrence Freeman uh, this afternoon. Anybody know who that is? He is the, he is the founder of the, the World uh, Community of Christian Meditators. And uh, he's, he has been teaching kids the 
meditate. And he says, and I believe him, he says that children are much better meditators than adults. Why? Because it's simple. And adults have to complicate things. And so to teach something simple to kids is easier to, to teach it to adults. I also see other evidence. Uh, in San Francisco, for example, there's this person called David Lynch, uh, who has been doing, trying to bring meditation into schools in San Francisco. And in one particular case, it was like one of the, the, the worst performing schools in the state. And after teaching the kids meditation, everything improved. Bullying went down, behavior problems went down. The number of, of behavior problems that reached a principal, right, those things went way down. Truancy went way down. Uh, uh, academic results went way up, so on and so forth. So I think that eventually, very soon, we're going to collect enough evidence to, to show that we cannot not do this. It's too compelling. It's better even than physical exercise. Right? And we cannot have kids who are unfit. So why can't we have fit kids who are emotionally and <coughs> mentally unfit? Cannot do that. Uh, there's one other thing, which was a question asked by the Dalai Lama, which to me was a very powerful question, but there was no answer at the time. The Dalai Lama was meeting a, a group of educators. It was, it was an education conference. And he asked them a, a question. He says, if the main purpose of education is to produce happy adults, what needs to change? Turns out nobody thought about the question before. Right? So I want to, for those of you who are educators, I want to challenge you with that question. If the primary purpose of education is to produce happy and compassionate adults, what needs to change? No. Thank you. Let's take this one down here. <coughs> Next to the camera there, thank you. Uh, good evening, my, my name's Carol. Um, Carol, hi Carol. You. Hello. Thank you so much for your talk and all the work you're doing to make uh, mindfulness accessible. Um, I think it feels very positive. Um, my own journey with this, um, in terms of establishing my own practice, what was key was finding a community of practitioners yes. in that I suppose I've been trying to practice for 20 years and it was only in the last four or five years when I've been practicing. I practice with the, the community that follow the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh. So I'm very lucky in that there's a centre here in London where you can go several times a week and you're surrounded by all these other people practicing. And that has been absolutely central to me being able to establish an ongoing practice. Um, and I, I'm just wondering if anything's happening in Google now or whether you see it happening in the future where people can actually practice at work. So I don't know, at lunchtime, somebody's offering sessions, etc. Yes. Uh, there is something called G-pause. Not, I mean, not pause, but you know, like pause as in stopping. Yeah. Yeah, I know I made a joke a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and and G-pause is a program that uh, basically, that's what you say, basically uh, get groups of people to meditate together every day. So that everybody will feel at least some support. And it's only true, th the reason we started this is actually because of my failure. Right? Uh, I, I people coming through my class, they're all very grateful. But at the end of the class, a lot of them tell me exactly the same thing, which is they feel like orphans, right? Like nobody's taking care of them now. So we started this, they are no longer orphans. And, and then I realized that the power of community. And it was illustrated uh, by, the, by the Buddha himself. Right? So Ananda, one of his top students, Ananda came to this idea that half the, half the holy life is your own meditation practice, and the other half is associating with, he called, admirable people, spiritual friends. So he came to the Buddha and said, this is my discovery. Half is my practice, half is associated with good friends, uh, admirable friends. And the Buddha said, nope, wrong. All, 100% of the holy life is associating with admirable friends. So community turns out to be more than 50%, probably 100% of the practice. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, while we're on this side, we'll just take one of the questions down the front and then we'll come back over to one at the back over here. It's just down on the front row. Over here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Um, I've been helped a lot with uh, my Nike Fuel Watch with my fitness. Yes. Um, because it tells me when I'm getting close to my goals and I set them. Yes. Is there anything that's wearable out there that can <laughs> remind you, you know, to wish people 
you know, they're happy you know, uh -huh. every hour. Or, you know, obviously there are lots of different <laughs> reminders that we have, but... There must be an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's an app, but um, that something more like the Nike watch. Uh, <laughs> yes. We, so a year ago, that was a thing that I was thinking about. And so I invested in a company, a Canadian company called Interaxon, and they invented a headband with four electrodes, which is enough to, to detect some mental states, at least know whether you are relaxed or not relaxed, whether you are focused or not focused. So we, we have the technology. No, so now it's just a matter of, of uh, what do you call it, perfecting it, and then figuring out what's the best application. So yes, coming soon to a headband near you. I, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, in the, and in the meantime, there are some apps that do little sort of versions of that, something called Mappiness that will beep you every now and then and ask you how you're feeling and what you're doing, which gives you a little bit of data on how your mood changes. <laughs> it, keep, not, keeps, not, it keeps beeping, I feel, I'm annoyed now. Yes, exactly, <laughs> that is the problem. <laughs> Okay, then as I said we move to one of these questions at the back, um, this row here. So the, the one waving at the back is the one I saw, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, what's I'm your sorry name? for my German accent, my English isn't that good, but I hope you understand me. So, so what's um, your name again? What? What's your name? Matt. Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi. Um, I would really like to emphasize the last part of your talk while you were talking about your dream that you said. It would be, you don't understand me? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm an old man. I'm not, I'm not young like him anymore. <laughs> no, um, I would really like to emphasize the last part of your talk when you said your dream is something in the world with peace and this stuff. And isn't it weird when we are looking at science, especially of the whole um, applied positive psychology stuff, mindfulness that actually all science is showing that the biology of the human being actually leads to a person who's good to other people who has a compassion kindness and all this stuff and we if then we look into the real world mm -hmm. and we see this dramatic shift mm -hmm. that this both parts are don't fitting together right and I mean, especially nowadays, with all the technology we have, with the internet, where so many people are connected with each other, isn't it weird that this kind of knowledge isn't accepted or isn't lived by all the people? And I really would like to think, and you know, to ask you what you think about that. And moreover, um, I know that you're a busy man, but I know some really, really great people are currently working on an idea, and if you have a minute after this talk, I would really <laughs> love to share that with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to remember the first part of the question. Uh, so I'm, an old, I'm an old man. I'm not young. So it was, it was really, we see that there's a distinction between um, the feeling that the, well, the science says that we should be compassionate and kind, and yet the yes. reality in the world is very different. What's going on there? In, in the real world, right? Yes. People, people don't Why is it that more way? people aren't really living this already? Uh, hmm. I think because, uh, how should I say it? Everybody knows that we should be exercising, right? But very few people actually do exercise. Very few people are fit. Right? And the reason is because it's effortful. It's kind of hard. So, so the first part of the answer is that if everybody exercises, then we will all be healthy. That we, it, the society changes, or at least some proportion of it. So, so the first part of the answer, the reason why people are not behaving well, is because we haven't reached the critical mass of practitioners yet. And I'm confident that we will in one or two generations. The second part is to make it easy. Uh, so right now, it's not easy. Right now, people think that you know, to, to get these benefits, to train in compassion, so you have to sacrifice something. You have to choose between playing on Xbox or meditating. Uh, Xbox, meditate, Xbox, meditate. Or watching cats on video. I mean, watching cats on YouTube, meditate. YouTube, meditate. Yeah. <laughs> Sacrificing something. I think the, the next topic I want to address in, in my next book is to try to solve that problem by, how should I say it? Uh, I, my view of the practice is that it is not a sacrifice. It is, it is joy. Right? My practice is driven by joy. It's a very joyful activity to be, to be sitting and in calmness and so on. 
And I think that if people understand that, then they will drive the practice. So I'm trying to figure out ways to front load joy into the process. Like, I mean, eventually, if you're a meditator, eventually you reach a point where sitting is consistently joyful. Then your practice is, it has momentum. So the, the question I ask myself is how do I bring it earlier for everybody? And well, yeah. after you read my first book, read my second book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got time, I think, for just two more questions. We haven't taken one from over here, so lady with a hand up, sort of halfway back on this far side, thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm afraid we can't hear you. I'm, I'm not, I'm not. Oh, there we go. Hi, Hi Caroline. Hello. Um, my question is, um, what does Google think of this? They haven't fired me yet, the last I checked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very inspired by what you're doing, and I hear a lot of this sort of thing. A lot of people here are talking about the fact they practice. I do myself. It's made a huge difference to my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm not seeing it happening in business in the way that you've been talking about it. So for me, that's the piece that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious to know, mm -hmm. what are the leader, leaders in Google thinking of this? And I'm imagining that they're supporting you. But yeah, I, I think they're supporting me. Uh, yeah, so I haven't been fired. And I know some large percentage of leaders are actually do, doing, uh, doing these practices. So we all, we all try our best. I mean, day-to-day -day lives, we make mistakes, but we, we try our best. Can I tell you a story? Um, okay, I'll tell you a story. When, so I was an engineer, right? And my excuse, my, I mean, in my defense, I was young and needed the money. But, <laughs> but I was an engineer. <laughs> and then when HR offered me this position to do this full time, I, I gave a condition to the vice president in charge. I said, my condition is, I am doing this for the world. If I'm serving Google only, yeah, I'm wasting my time, I'm not taking this job. I only take this job if I get to serve the whole world. And I was expecting a grudging, eh. but the vice president, he says, of course. So that was shocking to me in a, in a good way. Right? And, so, and I haven't been fired yet. <laughs> Keep it up. Thank you, Caroline. OK, let's take one last question. Seems to be the competition of who can put their hand up highest going up here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Meg, would you like to choose our last question? Yeah, have a mic. She, she already has a mic. Okay, she's got the I've mic. Got, uh, she's got the power. Sorry, Jen. And she's loud. I have to, be, I have to respect I'll the I'll just shout, Vernon. Sorry. Um, sorry, your name thank, is? Thank you very much. Susie. Hi, Susie. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm a mum of two wee boys at home, and obviously I want to bring them up to be emotionally intelligent mm -hmm. um, and compassionate beings and everything, but I'm constantly hearing from people, teachers, parents, friends, oh, Girls, they're just so much better at the emotional stuff. And obviously, I'm guessing at Google, you've trained a lot of men, because I'm guessing most engineers are male. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, uh, so yes. what do you think? Is it right? Are they right? Are they all sorry? Are they right? Are, are girls just much better at this stuff? Hmm, good question. I don't really know. Uh, however, I found one thing, which is I find a lot of wives coming to tell me she said, you know, after, after my husband took your class, he's a changed man. Mm -hmm. I've never heard a husband come to tell me after oh, my wife took your class, she can't change man. <laughs> yeah, so, so maybe that's it, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, I'm, on that lovely note, I'm afraid we're going to have to, to, wrap, to wrap up, Meng. Um, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. I think you've, you have just sort of, well. And they didn't um, mind me either. <laughs> you have a, a wonderful way of taking some really profound insights and making them seem like they're the simplest thing in the world, which I think is a real skill and has left me, and I'm sure all of us here, very inspired. And I was particularly struck by your analogy with physical exercise in lots of ways. There was the growing, you know, growing the muscle and 
and bringing the attention back, but also this idea that maybe we're on this positive path mm -hmm. because we didn't exercise a few generations ago. So I'm really inspired by that, and I'm sure others in the room are as well. So you've left me, and I'm sure everyone with a lot to think about. Thank you so much for being here. Meng is on a very busy trip um, to Europe, has been speaking in various places and has spared some time for us this evening, and hopefully you've, you've taken a lot out of this evening. So thank you to all of you for coming, and thank you once again for Meng for being here. Thank you.